Our next presenter, um, Hero, is working on a tool that I guess most of uh, the people here use. I certainly do. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the challenges of making such a actually great product. Please welcome him. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming. Konnichiwa. Oh, that was good. That was good. Let's try again. Konnichiwa. All right. All right. It's going to get harder. Guten Tag. Ah, good. Very good. Hello. Buenos dias. Kiora. Bonjour. Good eye, mate. <laughs> Hello. One more time. Hello. Zurveite. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here in the city of Sofia. Growing up in Japan uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s, the, one of the things that I had uh, contact with about Bulgaria, the country of Bulgaria, is this thing. <laughs> you, I, I don't know if you can read this, but uh, it says Bulgaria yogurt, right? And I had one last night, and it was fantastic. I really love the, uh, the yogurt. Uh, honey and walnut was really, really top notch. I really loved it. I work for a company in Berlin ooh, um, called Travis CI GmbH. And uh, before I get into the talk about control theory that I'm promised to uh, deliver, I'm going to start the, this talk with some story. Do you know who this is? Okay, um, uh, First Lady Michelle Obama, uh, reading the quintess quintessential uh, American children's story, Cat in the Hat. I'm gonna tell you a story, the story that I call Travis C.I. The Origins. This is Sven, Sven Hooks. Um, he was a Ruby developer in Potsdam, outside of Berlin, about 30 minutes in uh, Trent Wright, he had a problem. The problem was that he maintained the uh, Ruby gem. Uh, gem is a library that uh, Ruby developers can use um, called I18N. It's show for internationalization. And this gem is very popular. That's not the problem. But this gem was used by Rails. Do you know, how many of you know what Rails is? Okay, good amount. Rails is a very popular web fr application framework that sort of put the uh, Ruby, the language, into um, Western programmers' uh, mind. Rails used I18N, and Sven it was, and still is, maintaining that uh, gem. He had one uh, busy period, but some, uh, someone um, added a pull request to I18N. He had a very short time to test it. It worked on his computer. He merged it, released it, and everything broke. That was very bad. I believe this was in 19... Oh, uh, sorry, not 19, 2009, and he found something called uh, Run Code Run. This was a service run from Raleigh, North Carolina. I think Raleigh, maybe Durham, uh, where I live. And he had I18N uh, testing running on co Run Code Run for a while. It worked well. The problem with Run Code Run then is that it had to shut down on uh, April 15, 2011. Right. The testing uh, 
service that Sven was relying on was no longer um, affordable. Well, no longer there. So, what does Sven Hook say? Oh, uh, you did. It didn't go. Yeah, there you go. He says, "Well, I'm going to build one. I'm going to build a distributed CI server." This is June 16th, uh, 2010. I'm going to blow up one quote here. I figure it's going to be easy. It's going to be easy to do this. It's going to be easy, right? That's what every software developer says. It's going to be easy. I'm going to do it. I love this optimistic view of the world about Sven. And he still is an optimistic person, and I love him for it. He open sourced uh, what he had, and over time, he gathered people. Other developers said, well, we can work on this because we think this is a valuable service. Four of them came together in Berlin, hint, hint, and formed a company called Travis CI. The problem then became that of money. They didn't have too much, and they still had to pay for the, uh, the services. And it, is, it was okay when only 10 projects used it, maybe okay with a few hundred, but over time, more and more people started using it. Rails, for example. It's a massive, massive project, and people started noticing Travis CI because other people are started using it. So they ran their own crowdfunding uh, campaign, uh, love campaign, and eventually they raised, oh, I can't remember the exact figure, but $140,000, I believe, something in that neighborhood, and they bootstrapped it to offer paid service to private uh, repositories on GitHub. On open source, or I should say public repositories, the service is still free. And said, yes. Awesome. That's the end of the story, right? No? Of course not, because I'm still here. And this started happening. We have had a, who this is very difficult to see, but let's see. So let's see if I can do this. Okay, here we see a 500. Okay, I'm gonna explain what this graph is. This green part is the part um, that shows how many jobs are running on Travis CI. This is earlier this year, February 9th, 10th, 11th, and so on, about a week. And the red part shows the jobs that are waiting to run. The red is bad for the user experience, right? You push the code to GitHub and you expect Travis to run your build immediately and it doesn't happen. This is a problem. Why is that? Well, I'm gonna get to that in a minute. But people got sad. It's really, really sad. I mean, look at it. It's a sad, sad graph. I think this is the, uh, the time of the day in the United States, meaning that when United States goes, gets off work, things improve. I'm not saying anything um, beyond that politically. What you, um, what you see here is that when we have a static capacity, um, the number is 480, I believe. You cannot go over the capacity. When you have that, we have a problem. The one thing you can say about this situation is that it's like an airplane, paper airplane. You can come up with some complicated paper airplanes. I don't know how to uh, fold this thing, despite my upbringing. Paper airplane, once you throw it, there is nothing you can do about it, okay? You can, you can adjust the um, position of the wings or the, the way you throw it, 
but once you throw it, it's there, it's done, nothing to do. After all, that is what made the Wright brothers' first flight what it is. They were able to control the aerodynamics of the human uh, device that will carry a human being. There are things that made them special and they were recognized with a patent uh, from the United States government. So this will get us into the meat of this uh, talk, control theory. So what is control theory? It is a discipline, or I should say the subfield of engineering that tries to address this problem. In this worldview, there's a system that we want to control. It takes some sort of input and it, take, it emits some sort of output. We don't generally um, distinguish what, what they are but you just have an input, the system reacts to it and produces some sort of output, okay? If you want to control anything, what do you control? You need to control the input, right? And then you want to say, well, how intelligent should the controller be? One very easy way is to take the output into consideration. The output will inform the controller what to do with the input. Should I increase it? Should I decrease it? Should I not do anything? That's a controller. What do the controllers look like? It could be random. It's probably not an effective one, but it could be. You probably don't want to use it either. Not on the uh, airplanes, the real airplanes. Or it could be mechanical like this one. Do you know what this is? Okay, so this is a uh, thermostat on a mechanical engine. This device will sit between the hot and cool liquids. And this part, there's a spring here that will expand when it's hot. So the, this part, the bottom part, will be sitting in a hot oil, probably, and the, um, the top part top part, will be sitting in the uh, coolant uh, chamber. When the spring gets hot and expands, the valve between these two chambers will open and the coolant will go into the hot part and it is going to regulate the uh, oil's temperature down. And the spring will contract and it shuts the, the valve, all right? So that's one way of very uh, um, straightforward uh, control system, controller. There's also a thermostat of different kind. Uh, this one would have a uh, bi bimetal plate that will bend depending on how hot it is and the dial will change the circuit a little bit so that it goes on and off at certain temperature. If you have enough of them, you can fly 747, yay. This is a field that is, ooh, I didn't put this presenter note, but this is a field that is uh, pioneered by two French mathematicians, I, Laplace and Fourier. I used to remember his, uh, their uh, first names, but I forgot. Jean-Baptiste Pierre Fourier, I think, and Saint Simon something Laplace. You don't have to have a control controller uh, that is so massive that you can fly 747 with uh, to study the basics of the controllers. And uh, one effective one is called PID controller, process ID controller. This is where you're supposed to laugh because it's not. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you for laughing there. I appreciate it. <laughs> 
Um, this is the one that will uh, look at the, um, the system like this. We have a actual signal level uh, indicated by this gray line here. And over time, over time, the desired output level changes like that in green. How do you do that? We will look at the difference between these two things, the desired level and the actual output. Okay? You want to minimize the difference over time so that we can have a stable system. Okay, so let's look at that once again. We have error term at time here, negative. Is that positive? Positive or negative? The error is negative, right? Or the error is positive. The error is bigger than the actual signal, so it's positive, positive, the error is negative, and negative again. Stuff like that. Okay, this is nice and good, but it's a little difficult to work with, so I'm going to change it so that error term is shown against the zero over here. All right. At time t, we have e of t. And you, you wonder, well, what should I do with this information? At, error, at time t, we have an error here. If it is negative, we, we may have to increase the input so that we have a system getting closer to the output. It depends on what the system is, but in general, if you um, influence the input in one way, the output should work in the same direction. That's the basic idea. The bigger the error, the harder you have to work, probably. Right? If it's not, then you have a slightly difficult problem. But in general, the error is bigger, then you want to work harder, or you have to make bigger adjustment to the input. All right? That's fair, right? Well, what about what happened before? We, have, we may have accumulated so much error over the last how, it, how much time, you may have to work harder if you have a lot of errors to catch up with. All right? Does the uh, integral scare you? No, it's simple, right? Simple um, uh, integra integral of E of tau uh, with respect to tau over time zero to time t. And you can see that this is a function of t. Right? The bigger the accumulated error, harder you have to work. Well, how about what, how the error is changing? If the error is changing faster, maybe you need to work less because you can anticipate what is going to happen in the near future. You will get there faster uh, if the derivative of E is bigger. All right, that makes sense, yeah? Okay, so we have three functions, uh, E of T, the integral of it, and the derivative of it. All right, so we have three terms, um, and the controller U of T may be written this way. We have proportional term, integral term, and derivative term. You have PID, right? PID controller. Simple, very simple. Uh, you may notice that all these terms are linear with respect to each of these functions. And it turns out linear is very easy to work with. So uh, we use that. And it turns out that it is very effective in the most cases. You can make it complicated, you can make it uh, quadratic if you want, but it's not very easy to work with and it's not much better. So we have that. 
And you want to talk about um, how these coefficients, case of B, case of I, and case of D, uh, influence the system behavior. Okay, here's one such uh, explanation, one such um, controlled study, so to speak. Simulation, obviously. You can see the reference uh, value here, the blue one, that goes from one, I mean zero, to one at time one, and by changing the uh, value of k, we can say 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 .1 uh, 1.1 1 .1 and 1 1.6. You can see how the uh, system's behavior is different with just one term. You can change the case of P, no, case of I, uh, with the control uh, values KP equals 1 and KD equals 1 by changing the uh, case of I, the system behavior also changes. And same way with uh, case of D. All right, so we have various uh, controllers depending on how these coefficients are defined. And you want to ask the question, what makes one controller better than the other? All right. You want faster convergence to the desired value. You don't want to wait for the system to behave the way you want too long. Okay? Some wait is necessary, of course, but you don't want to wait too long. That's one uh, desirable uh, property of the controller. And the next one is stable system behavior. You don't want the system that oscillates back and forth. Okay? You, if you're sitting in a... Uh, uh, room, you don't want to uh, f for the you don't want the room temperature to get too high, too cold, too high, too low, and so on until you get to the uh, the place you want. So if you look at the uh, the previous ones, obviously this one, the the green one, is probably better than the red one. It's going to take about time seven to get to where you want, whereas the green one even though it oscillates, overshoots a little bit, it gets to pretty close at time three. The purple one is really bad. Uh, it's, it's going up and down and takes too long and so on. But some systems are pro more prob problematic than others. Now how's that? There are when, when we say a system is slow to change, there are two kinds of slowness, right? One is lag. It is the, uh, the changes to the system may not happen immediately, right? For example, here we have a stove. We start burning wood here, but the food inside the kettle, I mean the pot, and water inside a kettle doesn't get hot immediately because the fire has to warm up the stove top and then stove top will uh, heat up the pot and the kettle and in turn the pot will heat up the food and kettle will heat up the water. There will be a slow change in the actual thing that you want, the output, the food and uh, hot water from uh, burning wood. The, this is inevitable. You cannot change it. The other thing is delay. If you turn on the water, it will be a few seconds, I guess, until the water comes out of the hose here. So what does that mean to Travis CI? Remember, we had this situation. We wanted to add a uh, uh, dynamic capacity. This problem arises precisely because we are working on a provider uh, that had certain amount of server capacity. Okay, we could we could add more uh, server. 
the problem is we cannot change the, uh, the server capacity in a very fast turnaround time. Um, it is possible, but it took um, days and weeks for that to happen. Not ideal for the uh, build, service, build service that Travis CI um, did. So we looked at um, EC2, and that is where we are right now and trying to figure out what best to do. Auto scaling group has a this thing called uh, dynamic scaling policies. It can be triggered by metrics or schedule or uh, Amazon simple queuing service, I think. Uh, metrics, uh, as you can imagine, is one that says, okay, here is an event. You have some metrics that will inform Amazon to do something. Schedule is like a cron, cron job. At, time, at this time of the day, um, maybe perhaps weekday, day of the week, um, do something. Uh, we don't use uh, <coughs> We don't use SQS, so uh, it, we're not going to worry about that. So what can be done? What, what are the sort of events you can use with uh, ASG? One is changing capacity, how many you would add or subtract. You can set it to exact capacity. Uh, for example, if you go over, um, if you don't have enough job to run, you can shut them all down, for example, right? And then we can say um, a percent change in capacity. Add or subtract 5%, 10% from the uh, capacity at the time the event happens. And we are currently uh, doing uh, metrics and changing capacity. This is not exactly the uh, PID controller that I talked about. But this is the closest we can get. So how does that affect our capacity? Here we see the system delays because when we add a uh, capacity to our server group, it takes a long time for those capacities to uh, be available for use. When they come, they don't come immediate, all of them would not come live immediately, so there will be uh, lags like that. And you can see how this would be affected by um, looking at another graph with different viewpoints. Here, we are looking at headroom, the green one. This is very hard to see, I apologize. Um, there is a zero line right here. It's very difficult to see, but there is a zero headroom, meaning that we have the capacity and the running jobs equal. You, don't, you want to minimize this as much as possible over time because you don't want to pay extra for the things that you don't need, right? Oops, whoop, ah. So we have um, the headroom count over time like this and capacity going like that. And zero is somewhere over here. And we have the threshold for Amazon's auto scaling group policy. I think it's about 40. So what happens here? All right. The headroom dipped below the threshold, so we're going to add uh, capacity, but it doesn't come up until, oh wait, wait, no, 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 that's not right. The this threshold, right, capacity, no, 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 that's not right, all right. The headroom dipped below, dipped up, went above the capacity, that's right. Uh, so we, we started cutting down the number of uh, servers to run, 
right? You, we don't want to uh, pay too much. Amazon is already rich. We're going to slow down, so we're gonna we're gonna see the capacity uh, going down here, and then the headroom um, dips below the threshold, so we have to add more. So there's a uh, lag, and we have a capacity starting to go up. Now here, we have a very short period of time that headroom has gone up the threshold, so we start killing the uh, servers. But at the same time, you can see that the uh, headroom has dipped dramatically uh, below the head, uh, threshold uh, right after we started at, uh, killing the instance. This is bad. And you can see that we need to add more because we see that um, threshold has dipped below, but it takes a long time for the uh, adi uh, additional servers to come, li come live. And we have a sad area. And we had that uh, going on for a while. With headroom about 40, we had this very, very sad graph, even with the uh, dynamic capacity uh, that we allocated. So, what can be done to make improvements? One obvious thing to do is get more headroom, right? Thank you, thank you for the laugh. I appreciate that. And you can uh, do it slightly better. Uh, with a headroom above 100, um, we can, we reduce the, uh, the red paint um, a lot. It's still not ideal like this one. I can't remember why this was so bad, but um, the, the short of it is that when you have a huge number of requests coming in, we do badly uh, because it takes a long time to adjust to it. Right? You saw that. And you cannot go you know, uh, more, you can obviously raise the threshold uh, of he for the headroom value to be bigger, but you will be paying a lot more uh, for that uh, headroom. And we don't want to do that either. As I said, Amazon is already rich. So it, you, can be, you can see that it's better during the day. And even with the... Uh, some bad parts, it's still manageable. And here's another graph. And another possibility to improve it is to have shorter delays, right? If you have a system in place that will get your servers online faster, then you can adjust more frequently without uh, impacting the users. Well, how would that work for us? Uh, we don't know. Why is that? Because there are a few things in play. We are looking at other providers to uh, look at it. And frankly, there are other uh, tasks that needs to be executed uh, in order to make the service more reliable. Okay, so what is the lesson I, want, I would like to impart uh, with you today? Well, you need to learn new things. Without this uh, control theory, I was not oh, basically flying blind with our, I'm sorry. I, I was flying with my eyes closed. I didn't know what to do. Right? I, need, I didn't know what factors are in play. And until I learned the theory, I did not, I did not understand the system as an as entire system. Oh, that was very bad, he said. Entire build uh, capacity problem as a system. And I also like to urge you to learn from others, other people who have done the work, right? Laplace and Fourier worked on this, and obviously you can learn from these um, uh, geniuses. I think I'm running out of time, and I, at this time, I would like to say thank you for listening. And if you have questions, I think I have a little time to uh, answer Yeah, sure. Them. Uh, 
Let's thank him. You roll. Ah. And we have uh, time for some questions. If you would want to ask them, please use the mics in the center. Hi there. Um, great talk. Um, oh, there's one? Yeah, um, there is there one all? So um, okay. I've, I've used a little bit auto scaling uh, in, in a company I worked with. And one of the problems we had there was when you really need to react to capacity changes, usually it takes a lot of delay to provision the machines. So are you doing something fancy or more special to reduce this delay for adding more capacity, basically? Aha, uh -huh. uh, good question. The, the, a lot of the delay in our case comes from the fact that it takes a long time to prepare the, uh, the new um, EC2 instance. Right. It can be f short if you have AMI, that's the, uh, the image for the uh, instance uh, cached on in the region and things like that. It can be faster if the, um, the work to do is minimal. Um, in our case, we need to start with AMI and then we have to pull a lot of Docker images, as it turns out, and this takes a long time. And the uh, way we add instances would require uh, many of these uh, heavy uh, network bandwidth to contend from the, uh, the Docker Hub um, repository. And we used to get throttled. I don't know how bad it is right now, but if you go beyond a certain number, we still get the, um, the throttling effect and it takes a long time. The reason that we do it is that um, we have had issues with certain um, backends uh, being different and not as performant as a result, and the features that we want to offer to the users are not supported in certain backends and so on. Um, I was not ex directly involved in those decisions, but I trust their uh, um, the judgment in coming up with the solution that we have. We just want to make it shorter, but um, there are other cloud providers, uh, computing capacity providers that might work better with our use cases. Uh, does that uh, answer your question? Sort of. If you want to uh, uh, ask me later, uh, we can certainly discuss. Any more questions? All right. Um, I have a few stickers, Travis stickers like that one, uh, in my hotel room. I, I'm sorry I didn't think about it before, before I We'll walked visit up. you in your hotel room. <laughs> I, I will uh, bring some uh, later uh, today, so if you uh, oh. want some, uh, please uh, get in touch. I'm sorry I don't have the pride one, and <laughs> Mr. T, as he's called, comes in uh, different uh, skin tones and whatnot, so if you're interested in that, please uh, uh, come to me or um, ask, uh, uh, send email uh, so that uh, you can get some. All right, thank you.